right, our next speaker is a soldier, paramedic, ski patrol, heavy urban search and rescue team member, and healthcare disaster manager. He has spent much of his career in and around wild situations. Give a warm welcome to Grayson Cockett. Thank you very much. Uh, before I begin, I have a couple of disclaimers just so I can keep my job. Um, first of all, I am a healthcare disaster manager. I work for a large Alberta-based health services uh, organization who will remain nameless. Um, but today my comments are my own. So second, uh, I'll be discussing some historic disasters and some of the slides are maybe a little bit on the uh, distressing side. I'm really hoping not to dwell on the uh, on the, the suffering that took place, but ask your permission to talk about them in a bit more of a, a humorous and light way for the sake of the learning. Uh, so I'll keep my job, pretend I'm compassionate, possibly. Uh, <laughs> finally, I am not a disaster expert. Uh, disaster management is an ever-evolving field, and it's a convergent industry of lots and lots of people. Uh, and I would say if you're ever in the room with someone who says they're a disaster expert, you should run. But <laughs> Go. <laughs> and in fact, don't panic. So. Now, I put this here as a reminder for myself as much as anyone else, and so far I can tell you uh, that it doesn't seem to be working. So in fact, as it turns out, telling someone not to panic while they are indeed panicking, not super effective. And it might be missing the point entirely. So this is Pan in Greek mythology. This is the god of the wild. And he's also the god of shepherds, flocks, and according to a Google image search that I can never unsee, god of doing an inappropriate things with goats. <laughs> this mythical being Pan is also the god of panic, which is very fitting because in disasters, mass panic truly is a myth. Now, I'm not saying that individual panic isn't real. Certainly, the, the dump of adrenaline, the tunnel vision, the shaking hands, all of those four apps, the fight, flight, freeze, or mate, um, <laughs> these are things that are very real, and I'm very, very familiar with this. You know, as a paramedic, one of my favorite stories ever was talking about my first time delivering a baby. I, brand new medic, them, wonderful couple having their first kid, and the messy miracle of life plopped into my hands and all I could think was, don't drop it. <laughs> so when the father, in a desperate uh, fit to know what the sex of the baby was, asked, what is it? I, in a bit of a panic, said, it's a baby. <laughs> so yes, panic is real. It's embarrassing, makes you do stupid stuff, but it's also uniquely and terrifyingly a lonely experience. It's not transferable, it is not transmissible, and it's not what people do in disaster. So what do they do? Well, luckily we have 100 years of disaster re research to fall back on, which I'll try to get through now. This is the Halifax explosion. As a quick recap, this was the largest non-nuclear explosion ever caused by a collision of munition ship packed with, to the gills with TNT. Shockwave from this thing shattered every window in Halifax and destroyed 400 acres instantly, and 1,600 people lost their lives in the first half second. But that wasn't all. The shockwave upended the cast iron fireplaces in the wood houses, causing huge fires that couldn't be extinguished because the fire department had ceased to exist. All of this at a time of World War I when people were convinced that this was an attack. If there was ever a time to panic, this would have been it, but they didn't. Shortly after, Canadian disaster hero Dr. Samuel Prince became the first scholar to describe the true human behavior in disaster. The spontaneous formation of committees, the emergence of volunteers, and the convergence of aid from places like Boston despite all communication and transportation lines being cut off. Not panic. Unfortunately, Dr. Prince had his hands tied a bit with the social theory of the day, which was the man as a beast theory, or you might say, man as a wild. Now, uh, this is basically the idea that society and government was the only thing stopping us from ripping each other's heads off and becoming bloodthirsty animals. Not particularly progressive. <laughs> Luckily, we've come a long way since then, and a century of research shows us that far from being panicky animals, people tend to demonstrate highly social behavior in disaster. Behavior such as affiliation or milling, where people come together to verify information and make rational decisions which leads to altruism, not fear. In fact, motivating rapid action amongst the masses, such as an evacuation or something, is incredibly difficult to do. This is sometimes referred to as the optimism bias or even reverse panic, where people tend to wait and see as opposed to following formal evacuation orders. So if panic truly isn't an issue, why does the myth persist? Well, 
turns out that the media has a little bit to do with it, and this is just the way that it is reported. From exaggerated reports of looting and crime during Hurricane Katrina, to headlines declaring shooting causes mass panic while showing videos of people doing the exact opposite, perfectly reasonable actions like running away. <laughs> panic is something that we need to get rid of in the media's vocabulary. It's also a little ironic because the media had a huge role in debunking the myth in the first place. There's a century worth of photos and videos of disaster scenes where people are shown to be definitively not panicking, but instead springing into action and becoming the true first responders. You know, another reason this myth persists, I think, is because of misplaced causality, and dare I say it, a little bit of professional arrogance. This is a picture of the 1989 Hillsborough crowd crush disaster in which 96 people lost their lives. Uh, this is, a, at the time, was blamed on soccer hooliganism, drunkenness, and panic. But it turns out that when you severely over-admit people into a poorly designed stadium, then close all of the exits, the crowd has no choice but to act as a fluid mass. Pressure builds up, the air is squeezed from your lungs, and you die standing up, not from being trampled, as is commonly reported. It took 27 years for the police to take responsibility for this disaster. And here, you can kind of begin to see why I think this myth is so dangerous. <laughs> Uh, the inappropriate shifting of responsibility away from improper response or lack of preparedness and onto the most vulnerable, most impacted members of their society who literally could not have reacted any other way. It's basically scapegoating. And also, the idea that if you're in a position of power, you won't panic, but the rest of society will, is mind-blowingly arrogant. Uh, and it can quickly lead to this still common practice of withholding information to prevent panic, or as I like to call it, the you can't handle the truth paradigm. <laughs> My favorite example of this comes from the Three Mile Island incident where poor engineering practices brought the area to the brink of catastrophe. The public, understandably, wanted to know what was going on and in response the government and plant officials downplayed and lied about the impacts and went to so far as to say, I don't see why this is any of your business, just let us do our job. Now, if this seems familiar, it's probably because it's the plot of every zombie movie ever. <laughs> Something happens, the government lies about it, and society as we know it descends into chaos. And I've always thought this is a bit odd, because even in these movies which rely on the trope of man as a beast, what I actually see are groups of people coming together, being resourceful, and surviving. So this is my impassioned plea. Uh, if you're in the media, if you're in any position of authority, please, examine your planning assumptions. And if you're not, if you're just a member of the public, you still have a role to play in disaster, and know that it's okay, sometimes, to panic a little bit. We're not wild animals, and the only thing that's wild would be believing in a myth that's over 100 years old. Yeah.